Thank you. I'm Lisa Gillis, and I'm president and CEO of Integrated Educational Strategies. We are based out of Atlanta, Georgia, and we are an edu a national educational nonprofit. And what we do is we actually work with public, private, and charter schools and educational agencies from state agencies, um, beginning at the federal government, working all the way down to help integrate digital and blended learning. So we are, we, we call ourselves learning architects, where we actually go in and we do a, a, a study of where are you, where do you want to be, and how do you want to get there, and then we design the roadmap for them to integrate and re-architect classrooms to make 21st century digital learning come alive for kids and um, really get them into the global marketplace. So I'm here today to kind of talk to you about three different things, and the first thing that we're going to Talk, uh, talk about is get a snapshot of the current education system. So um, today, what is what is really happening within our education system? And I, some of this might be surprising to you, and some of it might, uh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So first of all. When we look at these different countries of Italy, Germany, Japan, France, uh, the UK, and the United States, we outspend all of these countries in per, per year per student. So the average amount that we spend on a, on a yearly basis is tw over $24,000 a year on students. So since we are spending the most in all of the industrialized nations, it begs the question, what are we getting for that? Well. Uh, the PISA does these results where they give these standardized tests to kids all across industrialized nations, and then they rank the nations based upon how the students perform on those tests. In math, in 2009, we ranked 23rd. In literacy, we ranked 24th. And uh, our rank is, is also declining. So you can see there in uh, 2000, 2003, 2006, and 2009 how we've continued to go down. Now in 2009, in 2006, they ranked 26 countries. In 2009, that went to 33. And even though our spending is increasing, our achievement is decreasing as compared to our global counterparts. This is really critical that we've, we've got to stop with the status quo and really start getting kids involved so that we can stay as a nation competitive in the global marketplace. Unfortunately, our graduation rates are also declining. Currently in the United States, I don't know if you're aware of this, but nationally we have a 70% graduation rate. 70%. That means that 30% of our kids who enter ninth grade do not graduate from high school. This is the worst it's ever been. Just extrapolate that out 10, 20, 30 years. In several states, their incarceration rate is higher than their graduation rate, especially in some demographics of students. Today alone, today, while you were here at this conference, 6,000 kids dropped out of school across our country. Every day this happens. And we are losing our lead in college attainment levels. So if you look at Canada, Japan, Korea, Sweden, Belgium, Ireland, Norway, and the United States, all of those countries have a higher percentage of students going on to post-secondary education and achieving levels. And they're competing against us in the global marketplace. For those kids that do go into college, 43% of community college students require remediation. 29% of public four-year college students required remediation. That's at our universities. One-third of the kids that go to our universities are not prepared to function in mathematics and literacy skills, which generally include essay writing and basic communication skills. That means that those colleges, universities, and our public systems have to pay for remediation for these kids to bring them up to the level that they should have been in when they graduated from high school. That costs us $2.7 billion annually in addition to the $23,000 a year that we are spending on each child to ed educate them in the public system. American businesses are currently spending over $60 billion on education and re-education of the workforce because they're finding that their workers are not trained and able to do the basic functions that they need in their workplace. So what's a solution to this? 
Now you've got a snapshot of where we are. How can we fix this? We talk about this in education all the time. We talk about, uh, let's pour more money into the system. We're seeing that more money doesn't fix the problem. But one solution that we really believe strongly in that will and can fix this problem is online blended and digital learning. We, we say all three of those because they are different. So online learning, there are kids who study in a full-time virtual environment. They may be enrolled in a charter school, or they may, in the olden days, we called that distance learning, and it was, you, would, you would mail something in, the professor would make up marks and mail it back to you. There are some folks that are, that are engaged in full-time online learning. Now, digital learning, I mean, blended learning, is, is when we actually re want to re-architect our classrooms for digital integration. Take the kids on a virtual field trip. Have a virtual classroom. There are so many digital tools, and that's the third one here, is digital tools in the classroom that teachers can use to help them. Um, you, you can now, if you use digital, oops, sorry, digital integration, just want to wake you guys all up. <laughs> digital integration in the classroom, that means as a teacher, I can now, at every single one of you, I can know what you did today and how well you did. So I've been a teacher and a principal, a school administrator and school developer for over 25 years. When I was in the classroom, it was all manual. A child read to me, I recorded it, I wrote it down on a piece of paper, I took that, I wrote out report cards, everything was manual and there was absolutely nothing that was digital. And it was all based upon my observation and my assessment of those students and then of course how they did on standardized testing, right? So today, we have things called learning management systems. We have SIS, which is student information systems. If these tools are integrated correctly in the classroom, that teacher now has the ability to look at Dan and say, Dan, you tried to take that math assessment four times a day, and the highest score you got was 60%. But it takes it one step deeper. It tells the teacher exactly what concepts Dan didn't get. So the next day, she can personalize her instruction and help Dan out. And it's not just, Dan, I'm observing that she's got some data to support her instruction. So when we talk about how online and blended can be a solution, here are some other problems that we're facing um, in, in the United States today. 52% of our middle school and 15% of high school mathematics teachers did not even have a major or minor in mathematics. 40% of middle school, 11% of high school science teachers did not have a major or minor in science. In Georgia alone, we have 476 uh, high schools in the state, over 400 high schools in the state. Uh, maybe you've heard of something called ESEA or No Child Left Behind, which, which mandates that every, every teacher in the classroom must be, quote, highly qualified. That means that they have passed mastery in the subject matter in which they're teaching. In Georgia, there are 76 highly qualified physics teachers, over 400 high schools. That means that just a little bit more than 25% of the students in that state have access to a highly qualified teacher in, these higher, in, in physics, which is a higher scientific um, field. So how can we solve that? It's, it's actually pretty easy. If, we, if I were to hire a teacher, in one state and you're highly qualified and I can now enroll kids throughout the whole state in a virtual program and that teacher teaches online, now every one of those kids, regardless of their zip code, has access to a highly qualified teacher. I had the privilege of starting several schools in California um, and one of them was uh, an online high school for at-risk kids and it was based in the Los Angeles area. I had the privilege of hiring a French teacher that French teacher was also a professor at UCLA. He happened to have a, a teaching certificate. Now those kids got to learn from a professor at UCLA when they were still in high school. Amazing. Why can't we do that all across the board? And why can't we just erase all of the geographic barriers and have kids enrolled anywhere? Why, why does it have to be state specific? And actually, we're moving towards that, where we are looking at something called the Common Core Standards, where states are going to say, instead of California or Nevada or Georgia standards, we're going to have one national standard where all of our kids will achieve at that level. And then 
if we could get teachers credentialed at a national level, now we have one teacher, regardless of where she lives, can teach kids online anywhere in the United States. Do you understand what kind of opportunity this opens up? For kids in urban areas, kids in rural areas, kids who do not have access because they live th three hours from the, the, the nearest largest city, and there's three kids in their high school that want to take AP science, so they don't offer it there. Now all of a sudden we can offer a complete course catalog to these kids. Here's another problem. According to the Manhattan Institute, 70% of students in public high schools graduate. 51% graduate. of African American students and 52% of Hispanic students graduate. And only 20% of African American students have college, high school college, leave high school college ready. According to a recent research from the Silent Epidemic Study, 47% said a major reason for dropping out was that, quote, classes were not interesting and they were bored. Do you realize that 88% of the kids who drop out of school actually were passing school when they dropped out? It's not because they weren't academically achieving. It's because something in life got in the way. Either they were bored or they were, they, they just, they had, they had to go to work. Maybe they got pregnant, I don't know. Lots of different reasons why we work with kids. And that was one of the things that we tried to focus on when we started our network of virtual schools is going after those kids who are gonna drop out and saying, you know what, we believe in you. We wanna give you a chance. Here's a chance. And, and it's been very successful. So virtual schools and online learning can help uh, provide equal access to rigorous courses for all students regardless of their life situations, regardless of where they live. So if you have a student that, that has to work during the day, they can come home and complete their classes at night. And these classes come, they're accredited, they can get a high school diploma, and they come with teachers who are highly qualified and who care about them. One of the things that was most interesting in the 100% in the, in the, in the virtual schools that we ran is that we thought, uh oh, we're a little concerned about the disconnect potentially because these kids aren't seeing their, their, their teachers face to face. And in surveys, they actually said, the kids said, 97% of kids said, my teacher cares about me. And they were able to do that because in a virtual environment, the teacher is one-on-one. -on -one. Pick up the phone, you have webcams. Every day, those teachers call kids, how are you doing today? What's going on in your life? And so for some of these troubled kids who felt like they were never cared for, it's phenomenal. The other thing that I witnessed that was a little surprising to me when we started these schools is that um, we, had, we had clubs, we had student government, we had proms, face-to-face -face proms, we had graduation ceremonies, we had it all. And you wouldn't believe some of the kids who were so successful in our schools. One child in particular, um, drop, was wanting to drop out of school when he was a junior because he was bullied at school. He was bullied because he, he weighed 400 pounds. So when he went to school, all kids saw was his physical appearance and they judged him for that. And he felt, he was depressed, he felt beaten down and it was like, why, you know, why live? So he actually enrolled in our school and now all of a sudden, kids didn't see him for what he looked like. They saw him for his presence online. And he ran for student body president of the state. This was in Washington, the whole state of Washington. And the kids in our school, and there was almost 3,000 of them, so it's not a small school, elected him president of the student council. That child all of a sudden felt, felt empowered that he, you know, he had something to offer, and all of a sudden he felt valuable. Now, I'm not saying full-time virtual schools work for everybody, but why are we saying no just because a child doesn't go to the local school? Why are we doing that? Why not give them options, right? So with today's students, it just makes sense that we need to do more online, blended, and digital learning. Do you not realize that 50% of students today are creators of content on the internet? 50% of our kids in high school have stuff published on the internet. Uh, the use of computer technology begins at very young ages. 67% of children in nursery school were computer users, as were 80% of those in kindergarten. 80% of kids had experience with, and we all know that. I was talking to a gal last night, and she took her three-year-old to a wedding, and she goes, I had to keep her entertained, so I brought my iPad. <laughs> and she said, the one thing that was really interesting to me is that my three-year-old was doing this. She was ambidextrous on the iPad. When I was using it, I did this. 
or this, right? She said she, her brain has already started to be wired, so she does this. That was amazing, right? So by high school, 97% of our children have used computers, and a majority are using the internet. So why in the world are we making them turn that off when they go into these classrooms? Why are we say, I've walked onto campuses before where it says, no, no, it has a big circle through cell phones, no cell zone. I understand the safety and protocol issues. I understand that. I mean, I've been a school administrator. I get that. But why, these kids are walking around the world in their pocket. Why are we telling them to drop it off here at the door? Because we're worried that they're going to be accessing wrong sites. We're worried that they're going to be texting their friends. We're worried that all these things are going to take away from the, quote, the learning process. But this is how, this, they're, di they're digital natives. This is their language. And we're asking them to speak a second language when they walk in that classroom door. 88% of our kids that dropped out were achieving academically. But they dropped out because they were bored. Do you think they would have been bored? If they could have used their iPhones, if they could have used their computers, if they could have used their iPads to communicate with their classmates. I'll tell you one other thing that I worked with a school, it was very interesting how they're kind of taking this to the next level. They wanted their kids to learn Jap Jap Japanese. So they went into Second Life and they, they, they partnered with a school in Japan. And so the American kids went into Second Life with the Japanese kids and they taught each other the languages. So it was, it was the child speaking it, through the avatar to the other child in the language. And then they had, they had uh, pizza parties together. So they would do this by teleconferencing where they actually had the, the kids met each other, you know, online. It was like one of those big movies, I mean, through the big teleconference. And then they had a sushi party because, you know, we got to... We have uh, the, the Japanese kids uh, hosted a sushi party. But then they took it one step further. And the Japanese kids came over to the United States and studied face-to-face -face in the classroom with their peers that they had met online in Second Life and through teleconferencing. And three, during the summer school, our kids went over to their school to learn in their physical environment. What an amazing opportunity that technology has brought us. Why can't we do that with all of our kids? So we want to say the disruptive design for our classrooms is that we want, this is exactly what we want to do. Um, it, it is predicted by the year 2019, 50% of all high school courses will be offered in an online format. Our kids need to have access to that. One of the things that we wanted to um, talk about really quick is I just wanted to show you a school in uh, called Carpe Diem in Yuma, Arizona, and their results are beating the math, I mean, in both math and science. They're beating all of the state and local um, results. So I'll speed through that and um, just wanted to let you know that if you have any more um, if you want any more information, sorry, I, I was looking at the time and I saw that we're getting there. So I just wanted, we did have a two minute video, but I think we'll, we'll avoid that. Actually, I'd like to show it if we have a little bit of time later because it's all about the flipped classroom. It's about this teacher who won a national award for flipping their classroom. And if you don't know what that is, it's really interesting, but we'll wait and see if we have time, okay? So, Eric, Eric come on up. Sorry, give me a second here. is embarrassing, a tech guy having tech difficulties. Oh, there we go, all right. Cool. Here, let me, uh, let me switch. All right, wait.
Okay, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'm Eric Simons, and I'm the founder of a company called Class Connect. Um, before I get started today, I just wanted to thank Ken for letting me uh, tell you guys what we're up to, because we're really excited about it. So a little backstory on me and how this company got started. I graduated from high school about a year ago, and uh, while I was there, I, I, I wasn't the most engaged student, let's say that. Um, and one of my teachers saw that, she was my chemistry teacher. And one day after class, she pulled me aside, I thought I was gonna get yelled at, right? And um, she asked me a question, and she said, you know, I can tell you, you really don't care about my class. Uh, is there anything I can do to make you more interested? It was an interesting question, none that I've ever received from a teacher before. Um, so I thought about it, and you know, being, being the tech geek that I am, I said, you know, why don't, we, why don't we take technology and bring it into the classroom? I'll find some web apps where we can like, collaborate. Um, I think that'll, that'll be pretty interesting. She said, okay, cool. Uh, you know, that's your extra credit homework assignment tonight for three points. And could have used a lot more than three extra credit points for that class, but I did it anyways. And so I went home and I couldn't, I couldn't find anything. I couldn't find any really good tools that I wanted to bring back into the classroom. So I went back to school the next day and I said, uh, you know, Mrs. Bennett, I couldn't find anything, but tell you what, you know, I'll build something. And so I started working on what is now Class Connect. Um, so after high school, I decided to not go to college and I decided to do what we were doing at Class Connect full time. And I managed to convince a couple of my buddies to drop out of college to come join me. And uh, we were, uh, we were able to convince a couple of guys to invest in us. And these are guys um, who are veterans of Silicon Valley, coming from companies from Yahoo to recently as Lala, which exited with Apple in 2009. And they, they have a lot of experience in building really great companies and really great products. And they've had some really great advice for us. Um, so we're really happy to be a part of them. And so over the summer, we started working on, on full time on our product. So that's, that's a little bit of who I am and how we got here, but I, what I'd like to talk to you about today is our core and, and what we do. So when we first started working on Class Connect, we wanted to build a company that made a really deep impact in the educational system. And so, so we looked at the current educational companies, ed educational technology companies, and we realized it was kind of like a, a disturbing trend, very recurring and re recurring trend, but pretty disturbing, and it's the one that, it's all about management. Management of grades, management of attendance, management of behavior, management, 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 everywhere. And we realized if, if a teacher's job is to simply manage, they'd be called managers, not teachers. But they are teachers because what they do is they teach. That's what they're good at. And so we wanted to help teachers do what they're really good at. And, and to, to really boil down what teaching is, it's, it's the transferring of knowledge. And we want to be a, cal a catalyst for that. So if you look at the way that we teach and the way that we learn, um, it, it's, usually, it's usually different than a lot of people think about it. If you think about a teacher giving a lecture, you kind of think of a teacher at the front of the room just talking, right? And just, just talking, 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 and students are kind of like taking notes and trying to retain all that information. But in reality, it looks like this. And this, this shouldn't look too foreign to anyone. Um, but there's... there's, there's one thing that's similar with both of these pictures, and it's content. The teacher is teaching from a presentation, and the student is learning from a textbook. And the re realization that we had is that a majority of learning actually happens through content. It's, it's not necessarily a teacher talking to you. You learn through content. And if we wanted to make a really deep impact, we wanted to have a way to give students and teachers really great content. We want teachers to be using really great content in their classrooms because we think that that's, that's the way that things are going. And if you guys are familiar with Khan Academy, this is what's so powerful about what he's doing and why he's seeing such great results. He's taking really great content, putting it directly into the hands of the students. So there's another problem, and this is the finding great content and creating great content is something that teachers have had to do for a long time, and it's called lesson planning. And it's a fantastic, long, and horrible process. 
um, to, to, to kind of walk you through what teachers have to do, they basically get a checklist. And right now, the big thing is the common core. It's a checklist of you need to teach your students concepts X, Y, and Z. Go at it. Have fun. And so they have to go out. And so the first thing they do is they look on the internet for good content. And they have to go to a ton of different sites to do this. There's not one place to find really great content. And so once they find this content, they have a springboard, then they can start organizing it. And it usually ends up being pretty unorganized because they throw it on their desktop and it just becomes a mess. And then they're also expected to be synced up with their colleagues on the content that they're teaching. And so they're emailing these files back and forth and, and manually syncing these. And it's just a huge headache. And finally, these days, if students don't understand a concept in school, they want to be able to access that at home, whether it be the parent or the student. So teachers are expected to put all this online. They have to go and create a website or put it on some sort of system. And that's, that's basically, they have to take all their content, reorganize it, re-upload it. And it's just this huge time suck. But what's, what's, really, what's really incredible about this entire situation is that you know, there's, there's over 3 million teachers in the United States with about 30,000 per subject in each grade level. And they're creating, on average, about 15,000 lesson plans that are very similar, if not identical, to each other. And this, this process, per teacher, takes about 200 hours per year. So it's just this huge time suck, right? So, you know, wouldn't it be great if there's a way for all of these teachers creating basically the same thing to work together globally, as well as at a school, a district, and even right within um, a group of colleagues, working together to find organize, collaborate, and share with one another in one place. And we think we built something that does just that. And we're launching it on January 1st, but I'd like to show you a quick demo today um, to get a, a, quick, a sneak peek at kind of our development builds. So let me pull this up, if I can find it. So this is, uh, this is what it looks like. Hang on, let me make sure I'm connected to the internet. What's my time like, by the way? Good. Okay. Five minutes, maybe. Um, so this is, this is what it looks like. It should look kind of familiar to other collaboration software. But what's really interesting is that the teacher has full control over how they organize their content and how they put it in here. And so as you can see, there's a folder created for unit one and unit two. And I can actually go and create more folders. So I'll add one for unit three. And I can't, it's not just for uploading files. You can actually take really great content that you find on the internet and organize it as you would a file as well. And so you can see here, we have a document. And you can open it right in the web browser. So your students at home don't need Microsoft Word or Microsoft PowerPoint. It just opens right there instantly. It's pretty amazing. But what's also really amazing is that it can take internet content, like a Google Doc, for example. Oop. And I can actually pop this open without leaving the Class Connect website. So I'm actually just sitting in here, being able to view all of my class content, not being pushed around to a thousand different sites. It's organized in a way that just makes sense. And this, this comes in really handy when you're doing things like Flip Classroom, because the, the big idea is that you can take really great videos and other types of content and put it in the hands of students. And we fully allow you know, Flip Classroom by allowing you to basically take videos and, again, embed them directly within our site so they can be viewed and accessed anywhere without having to be pushed anywhere else. So it's pretty cool. And what's, what's really awesome about this is that a teacher can get very atomic about the descriptions on the lesson plans and the content. Like I can go and add and I can you know, make an explanation of what's going on with these files. And so this product fits the teacher's workflow. It doesn't force them to do something that they're not familiar with. And for anyone who's used educational software, that's pretty remarkable. Um, and so we've, we've created this really great content curation tool where you can organize, you can collaborate, and it's, it's pretty neat. But to create really great content, it, it takes a really great curation tool, what we've, which would, uh, is what we've built here. But it also takes really great content creation tools. Um, and so if you look at an average classroom today, a lot of teachers use PowerPoint to give lectures. And PowerPoint was created for businessmen who were giving presentations about the latest stock quote and whatnot. It's a really great information distribution tool. If I say the stock market's up 30 points, that's easily understandable. But if I'm going to try and, and 
tell you about a concept like ionic bonding with, with just static text, it just, it just doesn't feel right. It's hard to learn from. So we thought, you know, could we, could we make a better lecture tool that actually can put content directly in the hands of the students while the teacher's giving a lecture? And we did, and we call it Live Lecture. And it works very similar to PowerPoint, very similar to Keynote and other software, but with a pretty interesting hook. So basically, you can see the editor here. It's very similar to things you've seen. But what's cool is that if we had all had laptops or tablets or mobile phones out right now, as I move through this lecture, you can actually move along in real time without doing anything. So immediately, it's already in your hands. But what's really cool is you can put content directly into the lecture. And you can explore it. And so as I play this video, it would simultaneously stream to all of your devices. But that's, this is just scratching the surface of what this is capable of. So if, if we're talking about the solar system, you know, as, as I'm talking about all the different planets, wouldn't, wouldn't it be really cool if you guys could actually explore that on your own, on your own device? And that's what we've got here. You can take this really rich content on the internet and you can put it directly into the hands of the students so that they can explore it while you're talking about it. Because that's all learning is. It's this process of discovering and exploring. And so taking this content, putting it in the hands of the student, it's, it's just, it's this, it, you, you just can't get it anywhere else, right? And you can also browse entire websites, articles. And so as you're giving a lecture, students can explore this on their own. And at the end of it, you can even give them a little mini quiz to see how much knowledge they've retained. So what we're building at Class Connect is a mixture of two things. A really great content curation system and really get great content creation tools. Because at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to give teachers and students the ability to just create really great content. And yeah, that's it. That's my demo. <laughs> um, before we bring the panel up, hold on one second. Are there any questions for any of our, uh, our panelists that we'd like to uh, ask now? Anybody? Show of hands. Uh, great. Do you want to go ahead and, uh, is there? Great. I, f I first want to thank all the panelists. This was an amazing presentation. So I think everybody should applaud for them again for doing this. <clears throat> and secondly, um, I teach at USC and at Chapman at UCLA. And I especially know what you guys are going through. And I just want to ask the last panelist, um, can you crowdsource the content from there? And, and if you can, do you suggest, in other words, does it get rated up and down so that the best you know, two plus two presentation gets rated the highest and that's the one that gets used the most? Sure. Um, yeah, so, so I, didn't, I, didn't, uh, I wasn't able to demo kind of our crowdsource functionality because we're, we're uh, about a month away from, from shipping, actually two months away from shipping the crowdsource functionality. But, uh, but yeah, so basically the idea is that we're going to have versioning of files. So if I'm a teacher and you're a teacher, I create an original document, you can take that, make a modification, and you can actually push it back out for the world to see. And, and the community of global educators will be able to vote on this, comment on it, rate it. And so th the idea is that you're going to end up with this really big repository of just really great content. Um, and the, a great parallel is Wikipedia. You know, in, in back in the late 90s, there's a ton of companies trying to put encyclopedias online. You know, Br Encyclopedia Britannica, um, World Book. And at the end of the day, what won was the content that was voted by this mass community of the internet. And it's, it's really interesting, and that's, that's, that's kind of what I was drilling into with, it takes a really great content curation system. Um, and we're working really hard to make sure that we have all the right triggers in there so that the great content wins. Because if the great content doesn't win, then, then the teaching and the, the learning that should be happening won't win either. So. Thank you. Other questions? Could, could the people with questions try to cluster, sit closer together? Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I recently read that I think South Korea is digitizing all their textbooks, and they hope to have that done by like 2015 or something like that. Um, how realistic is that? And is there anybody working on it? And once they are digitized, I mean, how realistic it, is it that we can expect students to have the tools to be able to use that information? Several people. 
start it out. You go ahead. Well, first of all, I mean, just as a broad overview, everyone's doing it right now. Um, all the biggest publishers are going for it. South Korea, sure, but with what's going on here, um, I think within the last 12 months or so, when it, uh, not so much textbooks, I guess you could say. I mean, obviously, if they're digital, I'm not sure if you wouldn't call it a textbook anymore. But when it comes to interactive books, be it books that have videos, graphs, um, almost what you were showing, you know, something that kids can actually interact with, but not just showing it to one person, but everyone can kind of play with it to their own means. Um, I mean, probably in the next four to five years easily. Um, you know, one of the things I was talking about with tablets is that it, a tablet doesn't just add a almost a science lab functionality to school. It's not just, uh, you know, you look at a microscope or something like that. For instance, I could take my iPhone, and if I go on Amazon right now, there's a $2 microscope where I could actually zoom in just as much as a microscope could on anything. So these tablets aren't just a, a one device that does one thing. So when it comes to textbooks, uh, it can replace that. It can add interactivity in science classrooms. It can add interactivity in math classrooms. So in the long run, it might actually be cheaper for schools to actually adapt these technologies than to buy books, books, books for every single subject. And then on top of that, devices that do one specific thing when you have something right here that does every single one of them. So uh, when it comes to the specifics of that, you know, time will tell, but easily in the next four or five years, that's still going to be implemented. Yep, and so a couple of points that are interesting to note is that um, there are major companies right now that are doing that, and they're, they're digitizing, but that's, that's great. But the problem is that uh, we have legislative barriers that prohibit schools from paying for that. So that's part of what we're looking, we're working on at a legislative uh, arena is trying to remove the barriers. For instance, schools will get classroom um, uh, course textbook adoption materials uh, money from the state. But within that, it says that it must be on, you know, textbooks. So there's, in some states, like in California, there's a seven-year adoption cycle. So you buy a textbook, and then you have to wait seven years before you can buy another one in that same subject. So the kids in the in classroom are studying from seven-year-old textbooks. So like the Pluto example, for instance, um, I was working with an online school at the time. The very next day, our content was changed to say that Pluto, bye-bye Pluto. But the kids in the classroom, six years later, were still reading out of a book that said that Pluto was a planet. So that's the... That's the, that's the um, the upside, thank you, that um, that we can go to, but but we have to overcome the barriers and the funding to make that happen here in the United States. I'll just add to that. We do a lot of testing of new concept developments in the textbook industry, and um, rather than digitizing the static textbook, I'd say the trend is towards um, you know taking textbooks in an entirely new direction whether it's atomizing it so that you can buy a page at a time or a chapter at a time versus the entire book, whether it's uh, O'Reilly Books has manja guides to calculus and biochemistry and they're really flying off the shelves, to um, uh, Pearson has a introduction to management uh, um, textbook that's more like a magazine and you can rip pages out of it and you can carry it around and you can throw it away when you're done as opposed to these hundred dollar textbooks. So I'd say that, that rather than sitting down and, and fastidiously scanning every bit of static content we have, I think our opportunity is in taking it and exploding it into a multitude of directions and the publishers are working on it, including my favorite, the SMS flashcard. So if you, if you, uh, if you want to be uh, uh, tested and have a testing buddy, uh, your cell phone becomes your testing buddy and the textbook publisher will SMS you questions and see if you can answer them correctly. Yep, and let me just add one, two other comments too. Um, when you look at what's happening across the world, so your question was a great one because it's focused on it, what's happening internationally. Um, we are way behind, like Singapore for instance, all of, all of those kids in those school systems, they have online content that's part of their just normal textbooks. And every year, for one full year, one full week, all of the schools shut down. And the teachers stay home, and the, the students stay home, and they stay 100% in school, but they do it all online. And the purpose is to continue to keep the students and the teachers trained on how to do this in the effect that there's a, a national emergency or an epidemic. We faced that two years ago with the H1N1 crisis here in the United States. Sometimes we had 16, 70% absentee rates in our schools because kids were sick or they're afraid of getting sick. Yet if, if we had taken Singapore's example, those kids could have continued to stay online. 
So um, that's another advantage that we have. But right now, we also have something called OER, which is Open Education Resources. And so what teachers are doing is that they're creating these contents. They're, 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 they're flipping it up on teacher-connected sites. Teachers are downloading it, and they're using it. But the problem is that there's no quality standards. So when you talk about online content, I've evaluated courses that were nothing more than literally a scanned PDF of a textbook all the way to some amazing interactive courses. And right now there's no standards on, on how we define quality and how that measures into adaptability in our schools. So that's another issue we have to, we have to conquer. Thanks, Lisa. Listen, in the interest of moving forward to the next part of the program, I'm, uh, I'm going to encourage you to ask questions of our, uh, of our speakers uh, after the session. Um, Lisa, do you want to set up the video we're about to watch here? Uh, and if I could just get the folks in the back of the room to uh, get prepared for video, we've got the audio plugged in. And, uh, so while John's setting that up, I'll kind of let you know what we're about to look at. One of the things that we're talking about is um, uh, how do we digitize classrooms? There was a class, there was a couple of teachers who were science teachers in Colorado, and they, they started thinking, hey, um, we want to we wanna flip it. So they made their own what they call vodcasts, where they recorded their own lectures, and then they sent it to the kids at night. And the kids could watch it on their phones, they could watch it on their tablets, they could watch it on their, on their whatever access they had. So the kids actually listened to the lecture, and then when they came into this classroom the next day, it was basically the homework. So they completely re-architected their classroom. So now the kids were using different digital devices, and the teacher was now freed, instead of doing a lecture type of series, they could go around and say, okay, you guys over here, I want you guys to do research on this. You over here, okay, what questions did you guys have? And they were able to really make their classroom come alive and vibrant, and um, they actually won awards, national awards from the from the Department of Ed and the President. And so we're going to watch a two-minute video. Um, the teacher himself is going to be speaking to you and, and talking about some of the benefits. So you will see for yourself what a flipped classroom looks like. I'm Aaron Sams, and I teach science here at Woodland Park High School. My ultimate goal, I guess, as a teacher is to help students become learners who can learn for themselves and by themselves. One of the problems that I was guilty of even prior to flipping my classroom around was the classroom was centered around me. I told them exactly what to learn, how to learn it, what assignments to do to learn it, and when to learn it, and how to prove to me that they learned it. I don't do that anymore. We changed the, the place in which content is delivered. Instead of standing in front of a class and delivering, here's how you do this type of problem, here's how this works, um, I deliver that direct instruction now asynchronously at home through these videos that we make with Camtasia Studio. Times till whole. Oh, we didn't do that last the time. the last step, they were already whole numbers. We had one, one, and yeah. four. Here, we don't have a whole number. So here's a few little tricks when you need to multiply by whole numbers. If one of your numbers ends in 0.5, you're going to multiply by two. All right, something 0.5 times it by two. Right. Okay, write this down, guys. Yes, if something ends in 0 0.3 or 0.33 or 0.66, you multiply by three. And when the kids come to class, they don't show up to learn new stuff. They show up to apply the, the things that they learn at home and to ask me questions about the things they learned at home. So now they could have my, my lesson, if you will, what I would normally have stood up and lectured to them in class with some added features, they get that at home, and then what they were expected to do for, uh, for homework is now what they do in my class. Life is different for me because I, don't, I no longer am the guy who stands up in the front of the classroom and just yaks at a student for an hour, or what, however long the class is. Now I walk around the, the class and I help kids. I, I'm a tutor, I'm a guide, I'm uh, the putter outer of fires, whatever it happens to be um, in my crazy chemistry class, I walk around and do that, I don't stand up front and teach under the kind of the traditional model. I'm Aaron Sams, I'm a teacher, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, and I love Camtasia Studios.